All right, I see uh, some of you have started joining now. I'm just trying to figure out the sound and everything, make sure everything looks okay. Looking good to me so far. I might as well get started here. Um, so I figure uh, I'll cover a little displacement on demand stuff right at first here. I've been getting asked a lot of the same questions uh, related to this displacement on demand and I kind of wanted to cover a couple of things quick. A couple people have been suggesting that the cam is junk after these things have the lifters fail. So I just grabbed a camshaft here. This is the camshaft out of the one that I did the conversion on where I actually did the displacement on de demand delete. And you can see that all these lobes are in great shape. Now the lifter that had failed on that unit, uh, no that's not the one, there we go. This is the lifter that failed. So you can see the separated, it doesn't go down all the way. That's the one that's actually broken. And uh, the roller is in great shape. So that one did not have a problem. Uh, one of the cams that I did replace that did have failed rollers it was a performance cam in a corvette now it's a silver with black kind of markings on the side corvette and uh, i have a video on it when i pulled the cam what actually failed with the lifter it was a catastrophic failure as far as the lifters can go uh, and this is the cam from that unit now my and there we go see that lobe there just totally junk and it happened to several of them now this one was just starting what else? Let's see here. Here's another one. That one is totally garbage as well. So there's that cam. Now this is a performance cam. This is a three bolt. It is not at all the same as the displacement on demand units which have this big single bolt in them. So now the valley cover or the VLOM you can see right here if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask, by the way. You can see the Vlam here. I have one of the solenoids in. I have all the bolts out because I want to cover a couple of things that's going on in here. So, you can see this little hole here. This is actually a bleed hole, and what it does is it bleeds off the oil pressure. To prevent a lifter failure on 2014 plus LT engines, uh, or are you just prone to failure by design? They are prone to failure by design as far as I'm concerned unless they have changed something on the newer ones. All the ones that I've been doing seem to be 14 or older. Now the new ones, I haven't been getting them in, at least not yet, but I know that they're failing. I know a lot of people are complaining about them failing. So that's something that's definitely an issue as well. So here is one of those Vlam units, and this is the solenoid for it. Now this solenoid, it doesn't... Uh, this is, thanks uh, Easy Fix for throwing that out there. And uh, this, this solenoid, it actually adds oil pressure. It's contrary to what people think. Now, the lifters that are collapsing, it's when they're engaged in oil pressure rather than losing their oil pressure, which is uh, a little bit ass backwards, to be honest. And how it does that, so you have a normal relief here, and this guy relieves, relieves the pressures that comes through that port. Now, the oil pressure that originally goes to that lifter to lubricate the lifter comes from the other side of that port, and that's just for lubrication on those lifters. The non-DOD lifters, it actually pressurizes those lifters from the other side. And these lifters, the DOD lifters, get their pressure from this side via the solenoid here. When the solenoid activates, if I can get this thing apart. Okay, so this is the first plate. This plate only holds down the solenoids. You can see these little Oh, there we go. See these little brackets right here? Those hold down the solenoid. All right, all for one. My truck has knocked twice now on cold start. Goes away after a few minutes of driving. I have AFM Disabler 2. I am sorry to inform you, you probably have more problems than displacement on demand. Um, when it knocks at cold start, that's not displacement on demand. That's another thing that people keep asking me about as well. Uh, so, cold start displacement on demand won't even be activated at all via the computer's programming and in fact I can't even turn it on with a scan tool when it first what's up Mick <laughs> anyway uh, so I can't even 
it, it, the computer can't even turn it on with a scan tool when it's cold. It needs to be at operating temperature. So your computer's never gonna enable displacement on demand at first startup. Now, if the lifter has an unusual failure, I suppose something may be possible, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think that's the case. I honestly don't. I'd have to see it to believe it, and I haven't had one of those cases yet. Anyway, this plate holds the lifter, or the solenoid down. This guy is more or less like a guide for it. I don't know. It's, I don't, I don't know. It, it holds the gasket down. It's, it really doesn't have any passages or anything. It, maybe it's just a filler plate. I'm not sure what the purpose of that one is. Maybe to hold everything down into place. I don't know. But it's there. Now, this is the gasket itself. And this is what does all the weirdo work. So, if I flip this guy over, you can see here we have kind of this goofy opening. Screw it, I'll trade my Chevy in for a Hemi Ram. I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> but, uh, so we have this opening here, and there's a screen. I don't know, see if we can get you to see that. No, that camera can't pick it up, I figured. I'm, I'm streaming in 720p because I know my internet can't keep up. But, uh, so we have these deals here, and there's a screen here. Now, if that screen gets plugged up, it may cause an issue. In fact, let's see if I can figure this out quick. Okay, that screen is coming from the oil that gets added to the system. So if your displacement on man isn't engaging, that's probably plugged. Um, but there's a pre-screen for that that sits right underneath the sensor right here. And a lot of people don't see that as uh, a reason for their low oil pressure. They just go, oh, I got low oil pressure into the world. But the screen there is actually what causes that a lot of times. Putting new cam bearings in right now because of this crap. Yeah, it's not necessarily because of the DOD though. Um, the cam bearings, when they fail, it's it's because of GM's piss poor bearings in there. Uh, look at the bearings when you replace them. They have a seam that that kind of it's like fingers that interlock, and those fingers take your your fingernail and rub across those fingers. You'll see how uneven they are, and they'll actually be worn really goofy too. So when they press those bearings and those fingers, they like create a little pop out on the bearing area. And when that happens, it puts a lot of stress on the bearing, and then the bearing will spin in its housing once it wears out enough. It's it's crazy how cheap these parts are in these vehicles now. Um, so there's your reasoning for that. That's not displacement on the band necessarily. That's just piss poor quality GM parts. So we have the screen that goes into here, that little screen that I just showed you for that port. And that comes from the oil feed and is right here. So when this solenoid, it's normally open, when it activates, it actually takes the oil pressure from here and puts it across into this passage right here. Now this passage goes into this channel where those deals are, but there's also this goofy little screen mechanism. I can't see it either. This camera just sucks for that. But uh, it's a front-facing camera on a phone. I mean, what do I expect? But this little screen here, it actually sits like that and it and that's kind of like filtering the oil there too so I'm hearing a couple of people that are commenting they're having a problem with the system being acting like it's activated where the lifters not stuck where it's not knocking or anything but the rocker isn't moving it's just in its like displacement on demand mode and I'm still trying to decipher what's causing that my theory is maybe the solenoids are getting stuck now when they get stuck, it's going to just allow oil pressure in there, but I, I don't know. I haven't pulled one apart that's had that failure yet, and I'd like to, uh, just so I can get a chance and try and figure it out. But that's kind of what's going on in these systems. So I thought I just wanted to cover a little bit of that with you guys. Uh, if you got any more questions on that, I will certainly cover it. I mentioned a injector driver quite some time ago. We got a few more comments here. I better double check before I get into that deal. Oh, I forgot. That's the other thing I wanted to uh, cover on this. So the Vlom. Now I recommended getting the non-Vlom cover plate uh, before I knew about the oil pressure being added to the system. So one thing that needs to be done if you do go that route when you turn off the, the DOD but you DOD lifters is you have to find a way to relieve the oil pressure in those those lifter holes. In fact, I'll go like this once. Making all kinds of noise. 
Okay, so you can see this is a LS2 block, but it still has the displacement on demand holes here. And uh, these holes, the oil pressure comes up here, the, the bleed by from the other port that runs along the length of the block here. And that port, uh, do I think the pistons could slap, could be cause of this knock? It's very possible. They are a pretty loose motor. Uh, it depends on how long the, the, or how, not how long, how loud the noise is. So anyway, this port that goes by here, it is a very, very large passage. I wish I could show you. Uh, I might be able to show you from the bottom, maybe. No, you guys. Oh, maybe you can. Okay. See this, this port right here? I believe that's the port. But there's a huge oil galley, two of them. And they go running along the full length of this block here. So the bleed by on these lifters is not supposed to be pressurized here unless it's in displacement on demand mode. And if it's in that mode, it's only because this is under pressure. So if you put one of those valley covers on here that are non-DOD, you have to find a way to either cut a small groove in the cover, remove the O-ring that seals it, and put like a little eighth inch groove in the cover so that it can bleed off the excess pressure. Cause there's not gonna be much flowing through here, but it will be a little bit. And it could be just enough to activate those lifters and collapse them. So if you get rid of that plate, you have to find a way to relieve the excess oil pressure that comes through this hole. Uh, what else? Okay, we'll get back into the thing that I was gonna get into here in a minute, unless you guys have any more DOD questions. In fact, I'll answer them as we go. What's up, buddy? I just added the range disabler to my 5.3, switched to performance mode, super quiet while driving, but pinging at a red light. What kind of fuel are you using? Um, just out of curiosity, and you know, if you put it in some kind of performance mode, it might have a little too high of a timing advance at idle. Uh, you'll have to maybe look into what they're doing there with their they're fueling. Maybe you're using too poor quality fuel. You got to make sure you use pre premium if you're in a uh, performance mode. 93 octane because of tuner change. All right. Well, where where is it from? Is it from a uh, shell or is it from like a, you know, you might want to look into a different, different brand. If you're doing the same one, maybe their fuel quality isn't the best. Uh, you might have to look into that. Uh, do you have a, a way to turn the timing down? A lot of scanners, you can go in manually play with the timing just it's not it's like live timing adjustment but you can't actually physically change it permanently with a scanner but you can adjust it at idle on a lot of vehicles if you can do that and you can get it to do it while you're just sitting there at idle I would try that see if timing changes it makes it go away because then the tune is just a little too aggressive especially at idle okay I don't know if I can switch cameras here I'm gonna give it a shot if I lose you I'll come right back Looks like I can switch. So you can see I have a little bit of uh, messing around here. Uh, we have a solenoid. Get my coffee out of the way. We have one of those DOD solenoids. Now these things are pretty high current. I wanted to show you guys this really quick. Um, this is a injector driver. I talked about it in a video previously. Uh, my original one. Five, three lifters fail. I'll read your comment in a second. L. Keller. Alright, so this is my original injector driver. It's complicated, hard to use. It's kind of a cumbersome piece of crap, to be honest. But it was my first one I ever made, and it, it works. So I used it forever. Now, this one here is actually really, really nice. My new one that I made. But I still want to come up with something to do with it. And I'm actually going to have a video on how I made this. It's way, way easier than you think it is. So... This thing can be used not just for injectors. Okay, so I have this thing powered on now. And this thing is really cool. I'm gonna go to L. Keller here in a second. Let's see, I had three AFM lifters fail at the same time. Oh, wow. Holy crap. Must have been driving for a while with a bad one or something. And it just took everything out. That's crazy, I'm sorry to hear that, dude. All for one. I have lock on YouTube with five threes with the small knocking noise. 
most YouTube comment mechanics say it's a lifter. Yeah, I know. It's pretty funny how people do that. They just assume it's a lifter all the time. Look. All right. So here is, this is actually a really simple unit. It's basically this thing I bought, this thing I bought, and then a little lithium battery. Now the lithium battery is telling, or, or powering this thing, which is telling this thing what to do. And this is like a relay. Uh, here is frequency, duty cycle, and again, I'm gonna have a video on this, but enough about this. I'll show you that in the video. We're gonna go ahead and, uh, if I don't trip over anything, show you it working quick. So here is power, just gonna hook it up quick. Now, this is one of those DOD solenoids. I figured I'd show it to you guys on this. See how that's working? So, God, that's loud. That is a loud solenoid. This thing is acting as a relay, essentially, only it's a, a solid state relay, so it's very reliable. That thing's supposed to be able to handle 180 amps. I, I can't see it, no way. There's just not enough material there, but that's what they claim. So uh, anyway, I wanted to show you this because this thing can drive solenoids, relays, injectors, ignition coils, whatever I feel like throwing at it. And uh, I'm probably gonna be doing a giveaway on one of these soon. Uh, they're relatively affordable to build, but I don't have a shell form yet. Now, if you guys know anybody in the plastic uh, printing printer world where they have a plastic printer and they'd be willing to help a guy out and print some plastic things out, my idea or theory is I'd like to make these and maybe even sell these. I want to take and print something out like this and have this thing integrated into it. So you can use it like a Tesla for powering injectors. So say you have your injector sitting here, you can just probe the ground side of the injector, which is, you know, they're always ground side switched, and you hook this other end up to ground. So it'd be like hooking this guy up to ground and then just touching the injector with this and you'd be able to see it working. Because you can change the speed of the injector, how fast it clicks and everything with this thing. It's super, super slick. All right, Yeg Mechanic. If I have a lifter fail, oh, yep, yeah, I've I've seen that scenario several times. Eventually, I'm gonna make a lamp out of one of those cam shafts. But I digress. All right, so that uh, that towing question, you definitely should not drive it. But a tow, I can see sometimes is extremely difficult. Since I'm here in Minnesota, we, we have all too often where it's completely snowed out. And if you park on the side of the street, you can get a snowbird ticket uh, or get towed away or whatever. So if you break down in a bad spot at a bad time, you could very likely get towed away. And it's very unfortunate, but what else can you do? Then you have to pay that ticket. Either way, though, in the end, it's going to be a lot cheaper to just pay for that than to pay for the permanent damage caused in the motor from driving it for too long. Um, unless the permanent damage has already been done and it's too late, then you just kind of really got screwed and you don't have a horseshoe up your butt. But uh, the only thing you could do is hope for hope for the best there. All right, well, I pretty much covered just about everything here. I don't know, you guys got anything else for me? I can certainly just go freelance now. Is it possible for regular lifters on non-AFM to create a tapping somehow? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but if it does, it's usually going to be because it's sludged up, and you can likely clean it uh, with some kind of cleaning process. That brings up a good subject. I actually wanted to talk about that for a long time now. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Uh, so when it comes to engines, there's another question. When it comes to engines and cleaning them, uh, automatic transmission fluid is your best friend. Uh, what you can do is you can fire up that vehicle, let it get up to operating temperature on your regular oil, then uh, drain it out. You know, do this before your oil change. Drain it out so it gets nice and drained out. It's going to burn if it's hot, but nonetheless. Drain it out and then put automatic transmission fluid in it. And depending on how dirty it is when you drain it, you kind of have to make the judgment call whether you're going to replace the filter or not. Um, but put the ATF in it and then run it for, I don't know, two hours or so with the ATF, just let it sit in idle every half hour to an hour, go out and fire it up, or, or you know, rev it up. And uh, when you rev it up, just rev it up nicely, bring it up real nice and slow, and then let it fall down. And all the reason for that is just to activate the variable valve timing. Now, 
That'll get the fluid in every part of the motor. After the two hours, pull the filter off and check the filter, change it. Check your oil pressure before you even do that. If it's dropped down at any time, you have to change the filter right away because that means a bunch of stuff has been broken free in the motor and is now plugging up the filter, lowering the oil pressure. So depending on how dirty your motor is, you're just gonna have to watch the oil pressure. But uh, your oil pressure with the hot tranny fluid when you first start it, you'll know right away when it starts dropping below that point to change the filter. So you do that for four to six to eight hours. I mean, you're gonna wanna start with a full tank of gas because you're gonna go through a lot of gas if you have a really dirty engine. But that'll pretty much clean an engine completely spotless. There's so much detergent and automatic transmission fluid. When doing a DOD delete kit. Cam in. Okay, so the DOD delete. The camshaft itself must be changed if you remove the DOD lifters. It has a different lobe profile on the DOD lifter cams than what it does on a standard cam. So it's an absolute requirement. Now if you go the cheap route and replace one lifter, I don't know why you would unless you're just trying to dump the vehicle. You know, if you're forced to do the replacement and you do one lifter, then just turn it off because that lifter is going to fail again or another one's going to fail right behind it. It's just so prone to failure. All right. Which truck would I buy? Honestly, well, what would you say? You said you said a size though. Follow the half tons. Okay, half tons. Uh I would probably go for the Ford EcoBoost, believe it or not. Uh solely because of the bang for the buck that you get out of that. I mean, you get a lot of performance out of those little EcoBoost motors and they're really good trucks up to 100,000 miles at that point. They need timing chains. Um, maybe even sooner depending on what you do for oil change intervals. But aside from the timing chain, so far the newer ones seem to be really good trucks. Now the first generation and second gen, you know, first in area of them, the 2011 to 2013, uh, I'd probably stay away from those. They had a lot of trouble. Now the newer ones, they're still having a little turbo trouble, but they seem to have worked most of the kinks out. Otherwise they are very good trucks, bang for the buck wise. Now, if you had the money, I'd probably go to some foreign truck, but I don't know what to recommend because I don't get very many of those in. You put transmissions in all your GM vehicles. Well, if you're running a 4L60E, you're probably going to be stuck doing that. They're kind of pieces of junk. Oil filter fill plus trans fluid, five quarts. On that ATF thing, uh, one more note. Because on my personal vehicles, if I go a little bit long at an oil change interval, every once in a while, I'll throw a, depending on the size of the vehicle, now like my Nissan Maxima, piece of crap but anyway uh, I throw a half a quart of ATF if I go a little bit long on an oil change in with my oil change and I just leave it running there I just leave it in there for the next term of the oil change and the oil always comes out a little bit dirtier but the engine looks cleaner just looking down the oil fill hole that ends up looking cleaner L Keller two lessons I've learned on the engine keep the VVT good point the VVT is a great thing Never reuse the original pistons. Well, yeah, the forged, forged aftermarket stuff is so cheap and it's well worth the money. You get such a better product for the money. Pistons slap on cold start. And then you can properly size the bores to make sure that it doesn't have that piston slap. And the best part about rebuilding a motor is you can actually throw a decent cam in there to meet your needs. Whether you want torque, horsepower, or whatever, you can get what you want out of those motors. Those motors have so much potential, it's crazy. 4L80, yes sir, that's where you want to be. Mick Dishiznit, you are correct. Oh, that's right. Hey, oil. I wanted to bring up an oil test here that I want to do with you guys. Tundras are pretty good. I would take a Tundra. Yes, Tundras are pretty darn good. Two Chevy motor. I have heard the 6.2 does have DOD in some of the models. Now, if you want to avoid getting the displacement on demand on a Chevy pickup, you have to go like a 2500 heavy duty. The frame and body is too heavy for the displacement on demand to be effective in any respect whatsoever. So GM disables it on those. It doesn't even install it. Uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go grab a little oil sample. I threw it out in the cold. It's about 9 degrees outside in, in the sun today. Now... It was like six below zero this morning. So I'm sure it's probably close to zero where those things are because they're in a shaded area. I'm going to go grab those quick. So I had somebody ask me about oil and what oil I recommend. Now, I have not done this test to any oil yet. Uh, this is just a first little quick 
test, but I have three different oils here. Um, all of them are 520, just because that's the only thing I had on hand. I really, I'm short on oil. I need to order some more oil. But uh, it's out in the cold, and we're gonna see what the viscosity does in the cold. I have two Lucas 520s, one synthetic and one non-synthetic. I wish I would've had some AMS oil or something. And then I have the Napa, it's like the knockoff full synthetic oil that you can get at any parts store. Any house brand full synthetic is the same thing, basically. So, ooh, man, that is thick. Oh, I'm gonna need a rag. Holy balls. Okay, so our first candidate here, Lucas 520 on the top. It was stuck to whatever's below it. We're gonna go ahead and switch cameras and let you guys look at this. I'll go ahead and just throw it on this glass table. Okay, so let's see, get a little further away. Okay, so I would say that that actually flows pretty darn well. So this is the Lucas Conventional 520. Come on, hunt stick. There we go. This is, well actually I'll wait to tell you. Oh wow, that's like watery almost. So it's like, almost like it's the way it's supposed to be. That's impressive. That's the Lucas Synthetic 520. And yes, Lucas has engine oil. Now this is the Napa stuff, the only one we have left. And actually, that flows really well too. I'm quite impressed. I almost want to uh, test this a little bit better and spill it on something. See how they spread out. All right, a couple more questions here, I think. What do I charge to rebuild a 4L80? I try to avoid rebuilding transmissions unless it's... Uh, close people to me or performance related and I can you know upgrade it somehow rather than a do do a full rebuild. Uh, transmissions are kind of a special thing. I know how to do them but I'm not efficient at them so they're very very difficult for me to make money on at, at all. I mean I pretty much lose money on those things because I'm too slow at them. 2007 SIL. Okay I don't know what a Chevy SIL is. Maybe uh Correct me on that. I'm not real good at uh, models, names, things like that. I know some things, but there's just so much to cover. It's hard to get all the acronyms and stuff, like the the LQ9s, and I, I really can't identify them very good yet. Now, give me an LS3, LS2, that kind of stuff I can identify, no problem. Motor oil weights. Uh, Yeah, I, I, the hell with that test. I'm done with that for now. I don't think that's going to yield me any benefits unless I was better prepared for that. Anyway, so motor oil weights. I hear a lot of people running 520 in the the GM trucks with this displacement on demand. I'm not sure that's really a good idea. And I say that because it's so thin and they're, they have such bad wear characteristics to begin with. I don't know if giving it a thinner oil is a good thing. I would think thicker, a little more cushion would be better. I would not run less than 530 in those. If you want a really good quality oil that's fairly affordable, you can get it at like uh, Fleet Farm or or even, uh, what's it called, Menards. Uh, but it's the Rotella of all things. Their T6 5W40 oil is actually a really good quality of oil for the money. Uh, it works really well, but it doesn't have the detergent in it. So... If you don't change your oil often, it is going to start to cause issues in that respect. You may want to add the ATF from time to time on that. Now that I have the range disabler, reading Mr. Cosito 5, is that right? Oh, it helps with the pinging, huh? Okay, so you, you're the guy who commented about the pinging earlier, I see now. All right, um, thicker oil helps with the pinging. That's probably because it's cooling the piston down. Your piston might be might have a hot spot on it, actually. Now that you mention that, you probably have some kind of carbon buildup on one of your pistons, and that's where the pinging might be coming from. You might want to identify what one that is. Maybe get an endoscope or something and uh, throw that down all the cylinders and take a look. You know, Get the piston down on bottom dead center and run the endoscope in there and see what you can find. You might be able to find a huge chunk of carbon on top of that piston. Oh, <laughs> wow, I can't believe I didn't catch that. 2007 Chevy Silverado. Yeah, I should have caught that uh, with the LS model. Is that exactly? All right, 2007, that's going to be like uh, like a, what would that be? That would be a LQ9? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I, I'll be honest. I'd have to Google it. Um, but Wiki Wikipedia has really good information on what era, what model year of what vehicle had what exact 
L-based engine. Now everybody calls them LS engines, but they're not LS engines. They're they're like yeah, like LQ9 or or LY6 or you know things like that. They're technically not an LS engine, but they are basically LS based because the LS was you know the LS1 was where it all pretty much started. L76. Oh yeah, Mick Deshiznit knows the numbers. So he's he's on it. Is the video quality working pretty good? It seems like it's, I don't hear any complaints. Looks like it's working pretty good. Now the oil additives. Uh, you mentioned the Lucas. Now if you have to add Lucas to 10W40, if you're doing the thick additive, I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean you're getting your oil pressures so high that you're probably just going out the relief valve pretty much all the time, even at oh, even at idle. Um, now I mentioned the cooling factor. On that, what it's doing is it's doing a better job of cooling down the the motor. Uh, you might want to try maybe 530 with the Lucas additive and see if it still works just as good because then it's actually the additive that's doing the cooling. I'd be curious to find out if that helps because um, that would mean that the Lucas has very good cooling characteristics for the oil. If instead of Lucas, hey, yeah, thin it out pretty much. But I don't know if that's gonna do the cooling like he's mentioning. You know, I think that's what's happening. It's cooling it down and keeping the detonation down. Have you tried any kind of uh, uh, octane booster yet? This installment of the Tempest. Oh, yeah, the Tempest motor. That's going to be a while. Um, funny thing is that video actually aired one week too early. So on YouTube, there's these Premiere options, and I attempted to hit Premiere, and then I scheduled it for next, well, it'd be this Friday now because um, now we're in the next week. But I scheduled it for Friday is when it was supposed to be released because I knew I wasn't getting the parts for a little while. So I didn't want to release it too early. And then an hour later or so, after I hit, you know, save or whatever, and an uh, hour later or so, I got a notification of a message on that video, and I'm like, oh, crap, it went live? Oh, well. Can't, can't anticipate everything. But uh, the next one on the Tempest is probably going to be two, three weeks out, to be honest. It's going to be a little while. I have a couple more videos that are coming first. In fact, Easy Fix, I got you on the next one or two that are coming out here. So, The newest Ram. Well, as far as Chrysler goes, 5.7, um, reliable. Try, I want to make sure I get it right. All right, so... When it comes to Chrysler, there's kind of a joke going around with auto technicians, and it's called Jesus Chrysler, because every time you turn around, Jesus Chrysler, something else is wrong. And uh, <laughs> when it comes to the motor sizes, anything that ends in a 7 tends to be high prone to failures, multiple failures. It's kind of the jokes that go around. And it's basically because that's what we always end up working on. We end up working on the Chryslers that ends in sevens. Now, I, I don't know why. I don't know if there's any truth or relevance to that. It just seems to be the way it is. I don't get much Chrysler products out here anymore. Um, little backstory on me since I have you guys here. I actually started this Craze Performance Repair official shop thing. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half, but it was only part-time. And a year ago, I went full-time. And the full-time thing, it was busy with a lot of performance work at first. Uh, I just did performance work for, God, I don't know, seven or eight months at least. And uh, it was just straight, you know, 1,000 horsepower vehicles, basically, I was working on all the time. And then I started doing more daily stuff again. So most of my experience with all the other vehicles is from the other shop. Now where I'm located, I'm out in the Hicks. I'm in the I'm in the sticks. I live in the country where there's a small town. I don't know what the population is here, three, four thousand, maybe. I don't know. It's not very much, but uh, it's definitely the sticks, and it's mostly domestic vehicles out here. Unfortunately, uh, now I say unfortunately because I actually enjoy working on some of the BMWs and so forth. I used to do a lot of work on German stuff when I worked in the city where I used to work. All right, uh, Brian Bannister, your comment on the 08. I don't know, that name does not ring a bell, so I don't think you're the guy I just got an email from. But uh, I just got an email, if you are, let me know, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, 
I just got an email from a guy who actually pulled the head and found out the lifter had turned 180 in the head. Now he wasn't sure if the mechanic before had installed it wrong or if the girdle thing had worn out because it seemed like it was worn out pretty bad. Uh, my guess is it had probably worn out and when he tried to tap the lifter maybe it turned because he had the little tool turned sideways or something didn't have it centered properly. I don't know. I don't know what happened exactly there. <coughs> But I know he hit it pretty hard because he mentioned getting the tool stuck. So, um, if, if yours turned, I'd be curious if a guy couldn't find a way to manually turn it. He'd need, it'd be hard to turn through that little hole, but there might be a way. If you can get bite on the side of that lifter, I'm trying to think if I can come up with something quick for you. See, these, this steel on these things is pretty hard. I don't know if you can find anything to bite it. And then there's this, this groove right here that lines up. I know you're just trying to sell. That's why I'm suggesting this. But, you know, m maybe, maybe if, it, if it's sitting this well, there's this groove too. I don't think there's a way. I, there's just no way. Man, if you, could, if you could get it to start to turn, then you'd be golden. Uh, oh, you know what? If you can get some kind of weird separation claw tool i don't know what you'll have to come up with that but to go through here there is uh, i can't see it there's like three slots oh there we can see it this way if i had a better light can you see those slots in there if you can have something that goes in there and hooks into those slots and then you could twist it from the push rod in you might be able to spin that thing 180. Uh, that would be that would be an interesting feat but if that thing spun this roller and the cam are junk and it's not going to be far before it you know completely fails so um i'd hate to i would not want to sell a vehicle like that to someone I'd, I'd feel so guilty putting that even at a dealership i'd feel guilty spilled my coffee over here engine flush before changing oil from eon cub cab cabinilla cabinilla i'm horrible with names 73,000 kilometers. You must be from Canada or something. My cylinder four collapsed. Tech told me the engine was full of sludge. Well, if your engine's full of sludge, you could very well have all kinds of other problems. But I would not necessarily believe him. He might have just said that to try and sell you a motor. Uh, it may or may not be full of sludge. You can certainly do a flush before the oil change. Coil packs, spark plug wires and spark plugs yeah that's kind of the, the telltale story so burn notice has the telltale story brings it into the mechanic and the mechanic says you need plugs wires coils the whole nine yards for this misfire that does not get fixed and uh turns out he has a lifter situation most likely right on the border of minnesota all right i am west of the metro area so i'm not probably too far for, from you depending on where you are on the border of Wisconsin so if you want to get a hold of me uh, the best thing to do is either email me my email is always in the bottom of my descriptions on my videos or uh, go to my Craze Performance Repair Facebook page if you have Facebook that's a really good place to get a hold of me as well try the ATF clean now the comment on the replacing Lucas additive with ATF I don't know if that's I, I mean, it, it might help. I don't know. I don't know what the cooling effect is with ATF, but I'm thinking that the reason the the noise went away was strictly because you're creating better cooling by adding the Lucas additive. Because I know that's what Lucas claims it does, is it helps adhere to the metals better. And if it's adhering to the metal better, it's going to do a better job of cooling. So I don't know if ATF is going to add the same thing to it. It might. It might not. He might know something I don't know. I don't know everything, that's for sure. I know ATF works excellent for cleaning things. That's why whenever you pull a transmission apart, it's always so darn clean. Except for the fluid, it's always dirty. You guys have any uh, questions on, on tools or any recommendation? Or, you know, not recommendations, but want any recommendations on any new or cool tools that might be helpful for you in working on your GM, since most of you guys seem to be the GM crowd here? I do kind of have a GM inventory of videos, don't I? So... YouTube certainly has a little bit of a delay. Yes, tools. All right. Shop tour. Short shop tour. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to get me off of here. See my ugly mug anymore. All right. Here's a 
messy toolbox. Oh, well, everything's messy. I'm always working so dang hard or doing all kinds of crap. But a little dartboard for some fun. Um, you know, security. Got to have my security. A little card of things that happen. This is a dyno sheet from one of the cars that I built. suppose you guys probably want to see that. This is one of the cars that's in here quite often. So he was down, I think, one or two PSI boost on this particular pull. But you can see he's he's making decent numbers on a uh, dyno jet. So here's a little little walk around. This toolbox is covered in crap. I always got some kind of project. I was actually working on a very weird, um, very weird Kevlar thing recently. So I, I I don't necessarily want to get into that. There's my lack of an office. We'll go in the cold half here. I have a sheet. I'll show you that in a second here. So I have a sheet. This just blocks the heat. So my Electric heater here is what's heating this whole building. It's not very much, but it's enough. It's my oil shelf. So, small shop, but nonetheless, it's a shop. Little paint sprayers. I do some painting. I don't do it for any customers, though. This phone does not have a very wide-angle screen. Here's the one wall that you guys were just in that other room. Here's a little cabinet. I'll show you those in a second, I suppose. My door, that's a, what is that, 14 feet? No, it's bigger than that because my garage is 20. I don't know. I don't know what that door is. It's only seven feet tall, though, so I can't get very big vehicles in here. Here's the Tempest engine. Nitrous refill station. That's what the, the pump there is. Parts washer. Nasty cluttered bench. Hydraulic you know, bender and press and the engine hoist parts I'm trying to sell. If anybody has a BMW 330CI, let me know because I need to sell that exhaust. Uh, some mark parts from my old Altima that I crashed into a deer with. My other toolbox full of clutter. This thing is cool. So this thing is way cool. The guy with the black vet is badass. Oh yeah, imagine that, Jason. Huh, wonder why. <laughs> But this thing is way cool. So this is actually a winch and it comes in this nice little box. So if you guys want a really cool winch, this thing is awesome. But you got your cable here, you got these little hooks, it comes with those, it comes with a couple yellow straps that I already destroyed. You got your little button right here. Hook it up to your car battery, just works phenomenal. That's something that's a really, really cool tool to have, especially if you have a trailer. All right, I want a couple tools quick. It's cold on the side of the shop. I should have threw my coat on. These things are a lifesaver. Now, I don't know if this company offers it anymore. They're Easy Reds. I know they're available in another company, but you have to get the ones that are like this, and they're also Spline Drive. There we go. So, Spline Drive is definitely the way to go. Here is, this is a Mapco set of Spline Drive. Those are very, very awesome to have as well. So when it comes to wrenches, that's the answer. Now these things are probably the thinnest ones on the market. Also, when it comes to thinnest on the market, Matco has the thinnest ratchet heads. So everybody you know, knows Snap-on, but Matco has actually got some really good quality stuff. Swivel sockets. <laughs> Here we go with Matco again. This is pretty much all my Matco stuff. These are the only things I really bought from them, but you know what I'm showing you. But you see that that design there? If you can find swivels like this, these things will not break. I have never broken these things. I had one where the little clip, I don't know if we can see that, that little clip that holds it in came out, but that was it. That was the only one I ever had to warranty. These things are so dang strong. I use the half inch impact on them all the time. 1,100 foot pound impact and I'm pushing 150 PSI to it. Bead blaster for my bead blasting needs for ceramic coating. Oh, pliers. I know this one was picked up at like a northern or something, but if you can find them with, come on, focus. There we go. See that crosshatch tooth pattern? This thing grabs a hold of everything. Matco offers this. Uh, I have the Matco one because that's the original one I bought. There's the Matco, so PSJ8B, if you want the brand name. Otherwise, 
they do have them at other places. You just got to find that crosshatch grip. That thing is awesome. Hammers. Snap-on, if you get the smaller one, has a really good dead blow for the small hammer. Their bigger one sucks because this handle has like a weird loose area in it. These IR impact guns are just awesome. Uh, 1,100 foot-pound brush. Yes, I will be saving this video, but I will probably be, it's gonna start unlisted so that I can edit out all the little dead areas, like the first, the beginning of the video when I was waiting for a little while to make sure people could join. Now, IR has a new gun for the 3.8s, this one, this one sucks, I'll be honest, it really sucks. But their new one is supposed to be pretty cool, so I have yet to try that. This Matco gun is basically an IRTI. That is an awesome impact gun to have for an air version. And this little guy, Makita, also makes one that's similar. And those things are the, the best thing to have. They save much time. Makita, I think, or IR, one of the two, makes a cordless, you know, it's got a little lithium battery ratchet. And that thing is really cool. I've used that a couple of times. I really want to get one someday. Uh, what else for tools? I don't know. Oh, if... Uh, if you do any engine work, performance work, you're gonna to wanna to get 12 point sockets, otherwise get six point stuff. Six point stuff is definitely stronger for making sure you get a good bite. There's another one of those. I ended up with two of those because I was working both shops. This is actually when Craftsman was still common. Now it's like Ace Hardware only. But uh, this fine tooth ratchet is actually a really nice ratchet. I have yet to break one of these darn things. These things are crazy strong. The only one that I broke was because I shorted it with a battery like I did. Where is it? Pretty sure this one I shorted too. Oh, maybe not. Well, I shorted one with a battery nonetheless. And uh, it destroyed the teeth inside because I happened to be ratcheting it when it did it. And it just arced across the teeth. But aside from that, I have yet to break one under load. Cheap tools. I do have cheap tools. These are definitely cheap though. Pro grade. Well, I don't know. They haven't failed yet, so they're working for me. But I think those are there's a lot of Fleet Farm crap in here. This is from Fleet Farm, you know, inverted torques. If you need inverted torques, just go to Fleet Farm. They're way cheaper than buying the snap-on crap. I have the snap-on one too, but dang, that was expensive, and they're getting worse. Well, that's pretty much I mean really unless you guys have something specific that's really all i can really cover tool wise there's really not much to go over hack if i can get this camera to stay it'd be a miracle um all right well i think i think that's pretty much it for this uh this first live stream went pretty good so uh be sure to stay tuned hit the little notification bell hit the like button that definitely helps me out too so We'll go ahead and get this video posted back up so you guys can see what you want out of this video later. And then I'm going to try and get that injector driver video out so you know how to build your own injector driver. Um, hopefully somebody will ch chime in here after the live stream about the plastic plastic thing. Because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to do some plastic uh, thing for that, that injector driver. That would be really cool. Rockers, see you above. Rockers, see you above. What, do we got some question about rockers? Did I miss it? <laughs> don't don't worry uh burn notice it'll be up soon enough if you have any questions ask them now i'm getting ready to log out here so oh i think i found it sequence in the rocker arms oh sequence in the rocker arms okay uh as far as tightening now if it's a stock try not to move ah it looks like i lost you maybe it's my wi-fi and my phone wow yeah you guys are losing me aren't you well, is what it is, I guess. Maybe my household has decided to start using the Wi-Fi, I don't know, or the internet, and it's screwing you guys over. I can't go yell at them because I'm not in the house, but is what it is. All right, well, with that, I'm going to log out here. Well, I'm sorry, Burn Notice. If you do have any questions, you'll have to ask me later. I'll do another live stream at some point. This is not working. I see that my internet is totally bailing out on me. Are you guys seeing me okay, or is it glitching out like, like I'm seeing here? Because I am glitching out really bad. I have almost a totally dead screen on my stream. Should I hang on to my 15 Silverado with the L83? Well, just turn off that displacement on demand as far as hanging on to your Silverado, and you should be okay. That's that's the biggest issue with these things. I mean, yeah, they have other problems, but all vehicles have problems. 
All right, I'm headed out. It seems like this is just way too glitchy. I'll see you guys later. I uh, hope to see you on another video here soon. Thanks for watching.